there's generally, if you read my book, The Animal of the Psyche, there's generally five stages of ritual magic. Now, these stages of ritual magic are used in not just the occult, but they're used in stage magic. They're used in hypnotism, stage hypnotist shows. They're used in marketing. That's what I learned about them first. They're used in communications. They're used in PR. They're used in the intelligence services. And they're even used in the military. There's five stages. You can read how they're described in Amble of the Psyche, but I'll, t I'll talk about them here for those of you that don't like to read. They are 1. Motivation, 2. Ritual, 3. Invocation, 4. Medium or Mediumship, and 5. Ensual of Outcome. That's E-N-S-U-L. The purpose of the ritual, and remember, it's not a supernatural ritual, it is a process that's very much grounded and concreted into the reality of the world you live in is to create change in the material world from an idea that was fostered in the mind so what was what was the idea fostered in the mind the idea fostered in the mind was to create a diversion from the westminster sex party where a young boy died and what was the change to get the diversion to happen so that was to create change to bring that into fruition to conform will with that of the magician the first part the first stage of the ritual is motivation the motivation was to make people in the alternative movement who were getting real results again to forget about the Westminster scandal involving the possible murder of a teenage boy by an MP. Then they devised the ritual. The ritual was the Hampstead satanic paedophile ring. To create the video in collaboration quite possibly with real satanists. And at least a cult. To deliberately place it in a, in a part of London where you could find... The Holy Hill and the Golden Yard and the Roslyn Chapel and all this stuff. That was the ritual. And the ritual, the mass or the high mass was the releasing of that video into the alternative, the alternative movement. The truth movement, the conspiracy scene, whatever you want to call it. Which was wildly and psychotically shared and exploded all over the place in no time. The indicator of a psyop, I might add. You have the usual interesting accounts on Facebook. Names like Avalon Moonshadow. Star Chaser Matrix. Wiccan Tree Goddess. And all these New Age buffoonery names. You can't find anyone behind that account. It's usually a picture of a galaxy, a unicorn, a rainbow or a piece of sacred geometry. And these are always the ones who seem to push these pedomania stories the most because they're agents a lot of them they're spook accounts creating the spectacular and they're part of the ritual the third part of the ritual of the the five stages of ritual magic is the invocation this is when you call upon a higher power in the the transubstantiation of the Catholic Mass, when the priest holds the Holy Host and the communion and the wine up towards the crucifix and calls upon the Eucharist, he's calling upon Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, to be infused into the wine and the Holy Host. That is the invocation, the calling of a higher power. And what was the calling of the higher magical power in this story? Mass hysteria. That's what it was. Mass hysteria. Something that is outside normal human behavior and cognitive processing. A state of psychic imbalance. 
a highly contagious psychically form of black negative energy which does not exist within this reality it's purely something that's an imbalance in consciousness in energy and that was the invocation so we have at first the plot to distract the ritual sorry the motivation then you have the ritual the video and the placing of it in hampstead probably in collaboration with our genuine satanic cult now remember the cult of the people in the video coaching the kids not the people are claiming that are in the cult just like in the Mal- Malficarum, the real Satanists were the witch find the generals who wanted to born women so they could get their get their jo- born Catholics and Protestants so they get their jollies and they the same thing they were the real Satanists not the ones who were in the fire things haven't changed folks then we have the invocation the calling of the higher power the higher power are the unseen force of mass hysteria then you had the mediumship the medium or the mediumship was the internet this the facebook the youtube all these uh truther sites all that kind of thing that's the medium to spread the hysteria okay and then finally the insul or the outcome to create change and they've created the change the change is that a so-called satanic plot that has been cultivated in the minds of the intelligence services to distract from the real case of the the Westminster murder of a young boy at a sex party has been now successfully diverted away look over here children look over here hysterical children I have new sparklers for you you remember the the witch the the, the child catcher in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang children and he has a cage full of sweets I have sweet study mixtures, lollipops, all the colours of the rainbow. And then the, the kids walk into a trap. The sweets from your stranger is the hype and the hysteria and the sex words, the fascination. And that's how that that's how that's the process that's worked. It's works in everything. The five stages of ritual magic are screaming out of this story. we're going to go to the next song i'm not sure what it is i'll announce it when it comes back i need to get a drink of coffee i hope you're enjoying this and we'll come back for the second hour of the velocity of now we'll talk a little bit more about this and a few other things and uh please stay tuned for the second hour after this song thank you paula and welcome back to the second hour of the velocity of now me your host thomas sheridan i've just been told that we're breaking the listenership records tonight the place is hopping and thank you very much again for staying involved and being part of this discourse because it means a lot to me because um I'm, i actually say I'm, I'm i'm very much enjoying doing this show i like that the fact that i have built up an audience of people who are true true real thinkers and even if they don't agree with me at least they're willing and mature and adult enough to stay along without calling me a satanist or a witch or anything any other horrible name because it they don't have to face the reality of their own stupidity now someone asked in during the break there someone asked me why is there five stages of ritual magic well it was it was in crowley's theses on magic where see crowley was good in the sense that he was very he, he, what he did was he got a lot of uh, magical text from going back centuries in may basically the hermetic text and you you know basically said there are five there are five stages of ritual magic and they uh this is what they are and he basically showed the the different canons and the different schools that it, about the occult that they came from and it's pretty common the in the european well it's not europeans actually again middle eastern but in the necro necronomicon there's thing called there's a, there's a part of the neck the the in the necronomicon the the re the redrafted version by uh, uh, what's his name oh yeah elphas levi zahed and also john d where they pointed out in the history of magic which is it that there's the ae the ae weight version which is from 1963 that there's five they're called of the verse signs and the purpose of these signs is to protect the magician now the first sign 
is the sign of your which is the one that the the, the heavy metals you oh that's when you see you're so ignorant out there sorry you just start and you have a picture of george bush and all these celebrities doing that one where they have what they call a throwing up the baphomet where the, the the two middle fingers are down and the thumb is not grabbing the two middle fingers it's slightly the thumb is pressing on the second finger slightly under the index finger and that's called this e sign of your four and the purpose of that is when you enter in the magical circle, when you enter into the magical circle, you must put that sign up there. It's almost like a tribute to the demon world. Now, people are saying, what's he on about? No such thing as demons. Diamonds and all this kind of stuff. He says there's not, he says there's demons and he says there's, 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 there's jinn and there's, 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 there's the evil. And, and, he, and he says all this stuff and he, 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 but he don't believe in, in, in a, in satanic pedophiles, you know. Now listen to me. Just listen to me, okay? I don't know why I have to. I do the Russell Brand voice when I'm invoking a moron, but it just seems right. Uh, when I said earlier on that magic is not supernatural in that sense, you see what the purpose of the magic ritual, whether it has candles, bells, invocations, standing in the circle, robes, darkened lights, jumping around the fire shaking the bones what the magician is doing is creating a pure stream of psychic energy that's focused that's what that is and so the ritual helps them do that and helps them feel comfortable you there's the magic circle is just a drawing on the ground it's not a force field against demons now demons are I don't know what demons are. There, there's, there could be a, an aspect of human consciousness, a broken as I can't. It, and to protect yourself, and when they say I'm protecting myself from demons when I enter into the magic circle, what they're doing is you're protecting yourself from madness, from fear. And so you throw up the sign of roar. What do you think is a satanic symbol that you see them all? And that's to protect you as you enter the magic circle. I'm going to quote here directly from the Necronomicon. Ooh, certain's a Satanist. Praise Jesus. Pra Holy Jesus Christ. He's going to read from the Necronomicon. Oh, my Jesus. Lo Lord Jesus. Hey, Lurleen, you know, can you get me another 64-ounce iced tea with 35 sugars? Oh, Jesus Christ. Get my guns and ammo. Okay, I'm going to read from the Necronomicon, right? Of the fair signs. The most potent signs shall be formed with thy left hand when they imply it them in rights. Ye first sign is that of Vor. It is the nature in it be the true symbol of ye old ones. Make ye dust whenever you would, would supplicate those that wait beyond ye threshold. That means that means the out the the calling of higher powers. Ye second sign is Kish. As it breaketh down the barriers and upon ye portals of ye ultimate planes. In ye third sign goeth, ye great sign of Noth, which sealeth ye gates and guarded ye pathways. Ye fourth sign is that of ye elder gods. It protected those who would evoke ye powers by night, and it banished ye forces of menace and antagonism. No, the elder sign hath Yet another form when it is inscribed upon ye grey stone of Nyar, it serveth to hold back ye power of the great old ones of all time. So basically, when you enter in the magic sail circle, ye sign of Vor, ye sign of Kist, ye sign of Noth, and ye, and ye elder sign, done with the five fingers. And that's probably the origin of the five stages of ritual magic. So basically what I have just done then, in the second hour of this show... I've entered into a magic circle of types, and I, I've given a kind of a salutation to the old ones, the demon world, not to attack me. So I'm giving you guys an education. You see, that's why I'm telling you to read my books. Read The Anvil of the Psyche and Valpurgis Night. I explain the whole magical process there through the history of National Socialism and even marketing and public relations and movies. Get yourself a real education, okay? I don't make this stuff. I don't pull it out of my backside. The source material is decades and hundreds and hundreds of books of my library. Going back studying years. 
Sharon, he, he, he quotes from the, some book of Necronomicon. He, he's a Satan man. He's a, he's a devil man. He's a devil man. I'm going to make me a video of the devil man. You know yourself. Anyway, that's that. Now, that's all I'm going to talk about for the Hampsteads thing for tonight. And uh, the rest of the show, we'll go back to our normal broadcasting. But that's just to show you that you've been played into a trap. Don't get played into a trap ever again. And you're no smarter than the intelligence services. And watching all the videos on the Reptilian Channel 2012 doesn't make you any smarter. Sharing articles, destroying a child's life, two children's life by sharing their videos. In closing... A, I believe that this has been created as a distraction from the Westminster sex party where a, a teenage boy was murdered. B, yes, I do believe there's a satanic element of it and they're not the people who are being implicated and being called Satanists by the children or by the adults. They're the adults in the video. C, the mother is an absolute disgrace for allowing her children to be shared all over the world like that. That the repercussions for those children will have for the rest of their lives will be appalling. She comes across as an absolute piece of work. Uh, secondly, uh, sorry, fourthly, this is, uh, I think, yeah. Uh, we have the okay. We've the mass hysteria is part of that to create that generation, that that whole thing. And I do think the children there might be something to the abuse thing, but it might not necessarily be sexual. I was looking at those kids. They are they're they're not lying. They're they're, they're trying to please the adults who've given them a script to read before the camera was rolling, and they probably got reward for saying it. And uh, they they may well have been neglected or abused, not necessarily sexually, but it certainly wasn't in a mass satanic paedophile ring. And f finally, stop being duped. Stop being. Get yourself. Get yourself a real education. And stop being hysterical, and stop feeding the Renfields and the 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 witch find the generals in the truth movement. Stop feeding them, because nobody wins. In a state of hysteria, except the black magicians, and isn't that isn't that the irony? Isn't that an irony? At the end of the day, those of you who think you're fat and Satanism and fat and the Satans, you're actually one of the Satans, the bad Satans. Now, I got. Tremendous numbers listening to the show last week. The downloads. I mean, I I, I uploaded the the first hour. I had trouble. Get, I, I think tonight I'm to get much quicker. We're getting better settled down, and within no within two or three days, I'm getting nearly three thousand listeners or or something to between two and three thousand listeners on the YouTube versions, which is amazing considering it's already been out there in their thousands as a podcast. So again, I'm delighted and I thank you for all that. And so, uh, last week, people said the second hour last week was the best hour of the show they've ever heard. And I spoke about my experiments with, well, basically electronic voice, f you know, phenomena, or whatever you want to call it. And yes, I've recorded these strange sounds in a jar. What they are, I don't know. Somebody said to me, have you really saying you caught a genie in a bottle? No. I was saying under fairly strict control, controlled states i have recorded interesting sounds according to prompts and questions i have asked i'm not ready to release it yet because i want to cover my ass so i don't look like a fool uh, when i i'm very you know me i'm a 40 and i'm very interested in the mysterious i'm very interested in the occult but i don't run in as a crazy christian in a state of absolute terror i walk in there and I look objectively, and sometimes the magic is in the actual investigation. I mean, uh, I think all the years of studying the psychopaths and reading books on serial killers and criminologies, I'd probably, I'm probably like a, a detective at this point. I think that's why I'm able to look at things like the Amityville, you know, the original killings, but by, by Ronald, allegedly attributed to Ronald DeFeo. And I give you that report a few weeks ago where I, you know, I, I do the backstory stuff. I played the sounds of what a Marlin three 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 rifle sounds like in order to prove that the neighbours were lying. That kind of thing. I go back and I look again. And that's what I did with the Jimmy Savile thing. The Jimmy Savile thing is very interesting. The Operation U-Tree th thing was designed to distract from the fact that I believe he's a serial killer. And to get you all... 
you know, when you really you really think about it, you know, it, all this focus on Rolf Harris and the rest of them, and they they pick on funny men and all these kind of entertainers. It, it really made people forget about how dark Savile was because it just pedophiles, pedophiles, pedophiles. You never think serial killer, serial killer, serial killer in the Savile case. Now, so I, you know, the electronic voice phenomena thing is something that's interested me all the time. And there was a, an, someone sent me an article today from the BBC, from the BBC magazine, and it said that this is from last year. The people who think they tune into dead voices, and by someone called J- Joylan Jenkins. And it said, advocates of electronic voice projection, EVP, claim that they use radio equipment to communicate with the dead. But are they just hearing what they want to hear? In 1969, a mysterious middle-aged Latvian doctor turned up in Gerrard's Cross with a large collection of tape recordings. He had, he said, been conducting experiments in communication with the dead and established contact with Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini and many other deceased 20th century statesmen. The recordings, 72,000 of them, contained their voices. His name was uh, Konstantin Rad- Radudive, and he called his technique electronic voice projection, or EVP. It wasn't real-time interactive communication. You asked your question and then left the tape running, remaining silent. But listening back through the mush and static, you could hear something just about make out as people speaking. Gerard's Cross was the home of the publisher Colin Smythe, whom a radio dive hoped would publish a book on his findings. Smythe was keen, but he needed to, to be persuaded to persuade the chairman of the publishing company, Sir Robert Meyer, that this wasn't all a hoax. So radio dive laid on a series of electronic seances in Gerard's Cross, one of which Sir Robert attended. As luck would have it, the late pianist Arthur Schreibel was online and spoke at least to the satisfaction of Lady Mayer, who was also present and had known Schnabel. The book called Breakdown went ahead and EVP was on the scene. More technologically up to date than spirit slate writing and less messy than electroplasm, it dragged the world of spiritualism into the late 20th century. Nowadays, electronic voice projection is a standard tool of ghost hunters worldwide. There are hundreds of internet EVP forums and many serious and well-educated people who see it as proof positive that the dead are trying to talk to us. For example, Annabel Cardoso, a former Portuguese career diplomat who lives in Spain and publishes the Instrumental Transcommunication Journal, she has a well-equipped recording studio and claims to have replicated the Gerard's Cross findings. My voices are not little voices, she said. They are loud and clear and totally understandable. And then she offered me the CD. Smyed, meanwhile, is, is still in Gerard's Cross. Radio Dive had wanted us to believe that Hitler spoke to him in Latvian, not a language he ever mastered while alive. He said things like Kindle willingly and you are girl there or else you are thrown out. I put it to Smythe that these were surely not the kinds of ustresses we associate with the Fuhrer, but he points out it could be identity theft. This is very interesting stuff here. A communicator is not necessarily going to be truthful. They could be using the names of famous people in the hope that they will be taking, taken notice of. Our old friend Pazuzu. Just like the Vuja board. These voices on the other side will tell you anything you want to hear and they will be anyone you want them to be so radio dive was a clever man he this is probably why he was so successful than that he wasn't assuming it was hitler it was identity theft something else maybe even himself or other people in the room projecting their voice their their psychic thoughts were doing that this is why if you're involved in any group or any individual that's getting messages from a Ouija board or is channeling, get the hell away from them. These people are incredibly dangerous. They're lying or they're psychotic and they will lead you to the gates of hell. And you can always tell that they're liars in that they, they build a... A, a smear campaign and cult of wild psychotic enablers around them and instead of actually holding their stuff up to test what they do is they attack non-believers you can always tell a liar 
a spiritual liar by how they attack non-believers. So what has happened to the radio dive tapes? In a storeroom in Smythe's house, almost impossible to get out for boxes, we finally found seven quarter inch reel to reel tapes, probably unplayed for four decades, and on one was radio drive summoning up the dead. According to a book published at the time by Smythe's partner, a Russian voice on the session said, Stefan is here, but you are Stefan. You do not believe me? It's not very difficult. We teach Petrus, but on the tape there is nothing, just a hiss. Well, you see, the reason why the sound could not be on the tape is because we know that audio tape, it deteriorates and loses its magnetic, uh, its magnetic flux over the years. The tape is it has it's coated with ferrous oxide, which is basically iron filings reduced down to a microscopic level, and the recording is made by either magnetizing them north south, and moving the magnetic particles according to the the frequency of the music or the speech. Now, what happens is if you have tapes from the eighties and old cassettes, or even good quality old master tapes from uh, your old recordings years ago it's the worst way to store them but what happens is that that those magnetic particles especially if they've been not stored in a good environment and it sounds like these uh radio dives were not stored in a good environment the magnetic particles they they just basically they dissipate and they lose their magnetism so just to say they only hear a hiss doesn't mean that those hiss only heard in the original tapes there very well may have been a voice at a very low level, but because of the dissipation of the magnetic charge of the tape, that has been lost. Back to the article. On another occasion, the broadcaster Giles Brandreth was present when Radio Dye produced the voice of the late Winston Churchill, speaking what everyone present agreed were the words of land and hope of glory. It was credibly Winston Churchill, Banderet remembers. But when we listened to the recordings of the tape, he had to agree that it sounded nothing like Churchill. It was far lighter than the familiar gravelly voice. Maybe it's a young Winston Churchill, Brand that Reth suggested, or a Churchill impersonator. But who impersonates the young Churchill? We couldn't think of anyone. When Cardoso's CDs arrived, I was disappointed in that the voices in Spanish and Portuguese were not really very clear. According to her translations, they said things like, that there is a rabbit on your head, but Cardoso was, like other EP inv EVP investigators, definitely recording voices. So what's going on? The simplest explanation is that the electronic voice projection voices are just stray radio transmissions. Usually they are faint and masked by static interference that it's hard to make out what they are saying and EVP investigators has to interpret them for you. This is not a bad theory. You have to remember we live in a world of electronic smog and for a long time now, even before Wi-Fi, there was you know, electromagnetic, electromagnetic frequency and sound waves can travel tremendous distances, especially if there's a, a lack of solar energy or solar, solar projections from the sun. I can remember when I was about 11 years old, just, I used to have a little, a, a very good but powerful, I think it was whatever the, the German, I can't remember the name, the very good German ra make of radio, radios, and East German radios, and I had a very powerful one. And I used to be able to pick up medium wave stations from all up and down the UK. For, I lived in Dublin at the time, late at night, and sometimes I'd, get vo I'd hear from the Paris, I'd hear over to into Germany, and then one night for about 15, 20 seconds, I picked up a station in Rhode Island in the United States. It came in, it gave the call sign, the DJ's American voice, and the the song was played, and it was the beginning of Sir Duke by Stevie Wonder, of all songs, and then it vanished. Now that shows you how far a radio wave can travel. If the conditions are right, if the transmitter and the, the electronics have... Uh, disturbance in the atmosphere is, is 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 so you know it's less than normal a radio wave can parts of it can project so that 
can project very far distances. So that's not an unfeasible thing. But people are recording these sounds now on digital recorders. So that now rules out the electromagnetic frequency because they would not record the voices like that. Banks has also ongoing project called the Rorschach, Rorsch, Rorschach Audio. He suggests that the voices are the oral equivalent of inkblot tests devised by the Swiss psychologist Hermann Rorschach. He argues that while, you know, when they put the paint on the thing and they fold it in half and he says, what do, you, what do you see in this shape? That kind of thing. He argues that while EVP experiments think they are doing parapsychology, they are actually unwittingly carrying out psychological experiments. You see, this is why I study the Fortean and the paranormal. Because when you discover what it's like, an academic said to me today, he was interviewing me for his uh, a thesis he's doing on people who are in the alternative media. And he asked me, he says, Thomas, what's, what's, what's in it for you? What, what draws you to it? And I said, I see myself as an explorer in uncharted territory. And that's what all of us are, not just me, but you, the listeners as well. And we're going into this uncharted territory without a map. Some of us are going, following rivers of ideas and information. Some of us are wandering into the wilderness. Some of us are settling down and creating prosperity and ideas and creativity in this uncharted territory. And my, I, said, my, I said, that's what I'm doing. And that's what dr draws me into it. I want to be an explorer. I couldn't, in this day and age, it's impossible for people to become, shall we say, Lewis and Clarks or Stanley and Livingston and, you know, or, at, you know, Edmondson, Edmondson and uh, Scott of the Antarctic and the Arctic. Those days are over. The new landscape of uncharted territory is the psyche and the truth movement. I explained in the first hour of the show what the truth movement is at its absolute worst. Well, at its absolute best is what I'm describing now, is that it's it's a voyage of discovery in order to f locate the El Dorado, which lies within, inside every one of us. And so this story I'm reading here is a classic example of it. I didn't go into it wanting to be validated that EVP voices were necessarily true or they could be I'm not saying they're not I'm just saying I didn't go in but what this really gets interesting for me is that we're now understanding and this that it's really telling us not about the voices on the tapes but it's telling us about the voices inside our consciousness it's really a psychological experiment so we've gone into the uncharted territory and we found something in there we can now begin to draw a landmark map to and that's what makes me being involved in this scene so much fun i love the uncharted territory and i love going in with the clean slate for example if you take recorded speech and place every sixth of a second with white noise the speech is still co comprehensible comprehensible but if instead of white noise you use silence it's much harder to understand we are naturally well adapted by evolution to imaginatively reconstruct speech against a noisy background. Imagine trying to whisper in a windy forest to your hunting companions. EVP enthusiast Banks thinks aren't idiots, they're just being fooled by audio illusions to take us all in. But once you start experimenting with EVP, it's hard to stop. After Breakthrough was published in the Radio, uh, published Radio Dive Progress from voice captured on tape to voices coming from animals, in particular a budgery guard, or a par that's called parakeets in America, called Pitsu, interesting name, who spoke at the voice of a dead 14-year-old girl. Similar work is being done today by EVP researcher Brian Jones in Seattle. He records the noises made by seagulls, dogs, cats, and even squeaky doors and crunching pebbles. They all contain voices. One dog says, where's Sheila? Referring to its owner. Another complains of its, of its owners. They always sail away. Jones thinks he can capture thoughts that somehow are in the air. I have documented a lot of things that are pretty stunning, he says. He would like to use his technique to help solve crime or pick the 
thoughts of stroke victims who have lost the power of speech. So far, he's been shunned by private detectives and doctors. That's probably because he's onto something good here. But the EVP community really want to believe they're onto something, and many of us find the idea of communicating with the dead so tantalizing, so appealing, and yet so elusive that it's easy to see how normal psychological mechanisms can be co-opted into making us believe in the unbelievable. See, people, you see, we're always told that it's this and then we enter it, or it's that and then we enter it, with that assumption. So when people heard voices, and say in the spiritualist movement, you had Harry Houdini. Now, Harry Houdini is often misquoted. They said that Harry Houdini, the great escapologist, spent his life exposing fraudulent mediums. He did, but Harry Dutini was not was not anti medium. He actually believed that these there were people who could actually get messages from the other side. He was just Houdini was just shall we say ec- filtering out the bullshitters up oh, under FCC warning. Filtering out the charlatans. Because he believed that there was something to this. And Houdini was not closed-minded. Now, Houdini ar- arranged that before he would die, that he would leave a message and uh, he would try and contact his wife from the other side on particular dates every year. And he never did. And it's actually, it's quite a moving tape to listen to his wife saying, good night, Harry, when after he doesn't show up. But the thing is that when we depart this this mortal plane, there is an assumption that on the other side we're still human beings. You don't have vocal cords on the other side. You don't have anything like that. So that was what made the the medium part more believable because the medium, if you could, if you were a sort of a disembodied spirit on the other side, you could enter into the body of the medium and use their vocal cords or their hand to write out things. But you can't project a voice onto a tape recorder if you don't have vocal cords. It's as simple as that. But I do believe there's something to it. I think there is. A, it is it's, it, we're in the psychology thing, but you see, when these things are approached by people who are materialists and they only believe in the mechanistic function of the universe and the scientism type approach, that science as a control mechanism can only explain everything. And the non-material simply doesn't exist. Of course, the the non-material, you know, the non-material exists. And I'd be tempted to believe. See, this is why I'm taking time getting this, getting my own experiment out there, because I want to make sure that that's not my mind projecting into that microphone inside the jar with the sigil inside it, which I put inside Lachian House, a place notoriously where it's haunted. And whatever haunt it is, I've been in this place and it would make the hair stand in the back of your head. Bricks were flying off the building at me. And it is also a magnet for occultists and rituals go on in there. And it's an interesting place. And that's where I left the jar overnight with the sigil that's supposed to capture a demon. And I sealed the jar with wax and oak. Brought home and the microphone is screwed through the, is, 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 is running through the lid and directly into the jar and it's not swinging it's held in there and then that's then sealed up with cement uh, the uh, fire cement so it's a completely sealed environment the microphone is only hearing what's in there or possibly sound waves that might impact on the glass jar's surface that actually acts as a kind of an amplifier and that's why i've been doing things like wrapping it up in loads of uh, duvets and blankets and putting it inside a box i want to make sure, as best as i can do it so or is it me projecting i don't know but i'm interested uh do i believe there are other forms of see, this is this is what people have asked me thomas do you believe that there's other forms of of life form yeah i do absolutely i believe there's other forms of consciousness our ancestors were right about the fairies they're not lying they were telling the truth we it's just been trivialized if you look you see people they could call them the fairies in this part of the world and they lived in fear of them our ideas of fairies is basically victorian or Walt Disney, that they're all Tinkerbells. It's nothing like that at all. Fairies were, our ancestors lived in terror of, fa- of, of fairies, in the same way people in the Muslim world went to extreme levels to avoid 
to avoid the jinn or the div in the pre-Islamic world or whatever they are in, in all the different cultures because psychic infection was a danger. To go away with the fairies was a, to say someone was away with the fairies meant that they were psychically infected by these other forms of consciousness. I don't know what they are. I'm not one of these people who says I know everything. I don't. I'm interested. I believe they exist, but I'm not sure what they are. But there is other forms of consciousness. I don't buy into the archons thing because there's nothing. There's nothing to really back that up. The archons was just a term that the the uh, the Gnostics used to describe uh, people in charge of power, power structures. And then someone says to me, "Okay, Thomas, you believe in the the jinn, and you believe in the the possibility of demons and 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 fairies, but you don't believe in the reptilians." And I don't. And, and I say, "Why?" Well, simply because the, the the ones that I mentioned don't have a form. You see, they don't have a form. And then they'll say, "Well, what about all these reptilian hybrid symbols all through history?" And my answer to that is, "What about the fish people?" What about the bird people? What about the minotaurs? There's no end of zoomorphics all true and anamorphics all true human art and culture of all kinds of human animal hybrids representing supernatural concepts. Men with wings, we call them angels. Bulls with human uh, horses with with human bodies, we call them senators. Fish people with human bodies and fishy tails we call them the selkie or the mermaid why single out the reptilian our ancestors weren't literally talking about a reptilian being what they were talking about was an idea they were encapsulating a psychological idea in a piece of art the problem is that people don't learn anything they don't understand art this is one of the things i want to do on this show going forward is i want to teach you how to read art how to read symbols and how to read archetypes the most ridiculous one of all is the current the Saturnalian one. That's that I'm almost, it's so ridiculous the Saturn worship and the Saturnalian thing in the truth movement that I'm I'm almost convinced it's, it's another psyop that was fed in to cause quick chaos. Apparently it's got something to do with a cube on the top of S- Saturn that is actually a hexagon, right? So that's somehow it's a cube. And those black cubes they have all over the world in public sculptures are temples to the Saturnalians and all this stuff. It's 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 just it sounds good and it's also kind of annoying to me because by by far Saturn is the most beautiful planet in the solar system. And I've seen some ridiculous things. That even a bowler hat is a is a representation of Saturn. I mean, this is the I've been in the Saturn cult and all this stuff. There's no evidence to back it up. It's just been made up and it just sounds good. And it just it's one more esoteric nonsense go nowhere thing. If I could find any hard proof for it, I would. There's no way it, there's no reptilians and also and also these other things require you to go into the world of aliens. Oh well they knew there was a hexagon on the top of Saturn because they flew out there in a spaceship. You know, we're back to that thing again. It's just straw man compensation, straw man compensation all over again. The uh, there were these beings, these jinn and so on on the other side are not physical beings. They're not actual shapes. They don't have a shape. Now, they could enter into the bodies of humans or animals. And I think I believe that's actually what a lot of demonic possession is. is. I think, And I even think at some level that's what psychopaths are. But they're not reptilians. They're, not, they're nothing like that. There's none of that stuff going on. They're, they don't have a shape. They don't have a form. And that's what's ridiculous about the idea that they actually have a shape and a form. They don't. They have no shape. They have no form. These are just encapsulated ideas brought forward in an artistic representation to help you, under- our ancestors, understand the concept, to pin it down. You see, remember, in the past, most people were illiterate. They couldn't read and write. So an image or a graphic was used for that purpose instead. That's why there was so much work put into illustrated manuscripts because the actual pictures were so big. It helped, you know, if you were if you had an illustrated manuscript talking about the witches. Well, most people couldn't read that, but there'd be a big stupid picture of all the women lining up to kiss the bottom of Satan. And so that's why the illustrated manuscript contained these drawings. It's to help convey the image. And because we're assuming that people in the past had the same level of literacy we have today that they took those things literally quote unquote they didn't they didn't read the text the the person would say 
there is a demon in this world and here's what they look like or there's a demon there's a there's a, a reptilian shape and this reptilian shape symbolizes the the bad behavior that you're up to you know and it's interesting because that could be connected to the reptilian cortex of the brain and then you would point to the reptilian you would point to the horse the minotaur this would deal with things like sexuality there was all kinds of symbol symbology is a better term to use and archetypes shown through these art but they weren't necessarily that and this is for me is the beauty of this stuff is that exploration because if someone someone says they're reptilians and they're from another planet then it's case closed and a, a wall has been drawn around your psyche saying to you they're reptilians and that's it and therefore do not explain anything else do not go looking anywhere else stay within the little war world i put you in you see what i'm saying you see it's this, a light in the sky they're aliens from another planet no it's a light in the sky let's take it from that point on stay within my little world my mufon world of every light in the sky is an alien spacecraft that's visiting stay in my magic my black magic circle you see how we get duped even in this whole thing because a lot of it has to do with protecting their franchise their truth franchise now i'm not it may sound like i'm picking on people they're all they're all doing it i didn't do it with the psychopath thing uh, in fact i was attacked by people a cult that taught that see themselves as the representation of the psychopath in the alternative movement as the the, the the source you go to my attitude was i want everyone talking about this i don't even care if i'm never remembered for bringing the psychopath stuff out once it's out there and that's why i gladly help people who are you know taking the baton from me and and running with it and going that direction because i want this information out there and i don't necessarily have to have my name attached to it i'm reaching around here to grab a magazine and we're in the land of synchronicity and this month's 40 and times magazine in the strange day section go i won't read the article this week but go out and buy it and it's it's the title you're going to laugh when you hear this it's called the gin on the increase and basically you know i'm not saying this is me that caused this but i'm just saying that i whenever i seem to get into something it starts popping up everywhere and here we go everyone's now talking about the gin and the inside 14 magazine 14 times magazine there's loads all about the gin how it's you know it's back bigger than ever in the middle east how it's entering into the western canon and so there you go you see there's um, the collective conscious at work again now i've got nine minutes left and i want to talk about something that popped up with uh, a chap on my wall called mark that many of you know about my facebook page we, he, i talked to him a lot and uh, it was something that came out in relation to the holly greed case i won't go into detail about it but basically last night i was out and i was talking to somebody and we were talking about how you can't get a, a a cup of tea as good as the cup of tea that you have in your own home. You, there are other people who can make lovely cups of tea. But for some reason, your tea that you make is the best. And by the same token, there are people who make tea and it's truly atrocious. I think this has a lot to do with the Dr. Emoto concept of the energetic particles of a person going into the food if they love you the food will be delicious and you'll know it uh, that's why i would never eat anything made by that lunatic uh what's his name that scottish guy the scottish guy who screams in the kitchen i can't remember his name now pass me but uh those kinds of people and those kinds of chefs who scream and people who where there's ever there's, there's uh, hysteria or madness in a kitchen that's going to go into the food but the thing happens with tea if someone has a, a lot of love and kindness for you and they make a cup of tea and it's lovely it will you will taste that that's also why our grandmothers and grandparents before that used to read tea leaves at the bottom of the cup there's something about the because this tea is mostly water with a slight amount of like you know flowers in it whatever it is in there fragrance that's basically what it is a fragrant water tea is a is an almost powerful sub substance it seems to be very responsive to the psychic state of the person who's making the tea 
and this is why tea in someone if you someone comes into your life and they make a cup of tea and if the tea is awful it's always awful tasting and think about it, how can you screw up a cup of tea right you have to be come to terms that there's something energetically not right with that person that the tea tastes that bad because the energy is transferred into the water and this person this is why this is how the the conversation came up tonight in relation to in relation to down syndrome people one of the reasons down syndrome people they don't let them make tea is not because they'll burn themselves because most down syndrome people are not that in, you know they're not that dysfunctional it's because the tea tastes horrible because whatever makes them down syndrome they're energetically it's 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 shattered the same with insane people you don't let them near kettles not because they'll scald themselves or scald you it's because the, you literally taste the tea it'll be bad i'm not putting down these people i'm not saying there's anything wrong with them but tea like remember the earlier on i mentioned the psychic the psychotic barometer when people when the psych when the people you know who are psychotic and unstable or have a history of a mental illness or haven't been sectioned are in a state of wild hysteria you know that black magic is you know black magic or black sorcery is on the increase because they're the barometers in a social sense you'd have what i call the danzig effect where people the same thing the same with the tea tea seems to be an excellent barometer for knowing if someone really loves you or really hates you or has no feelings for you and that's why on a build you see I, i've worked on unlike most people in this movement i didn't have like a nice wealthy middle class background i had to start out i had to i didn't you know i didn't have a charmed life in a, in a, in a top job i had to start out working on building sites and one thing i always noticed on the building site was the young lad always makes the tea for the rest of them so the young kid the young laborer the young lad who's always makes the tea for the rest of the older men and the reason for that is the young lads is subconsciously is trusted with making the tea not because he's a grunt or because he's a you know a lower form of life but the young lads subconsciously they're aware that his energy is purer than the older men he's not filled with the same bitterness alcoholism dysfunctionality hatred angers frustration as the older ones so he's a young kid he's making money he's having a laugh he's usually the kid on the building site telling the jokes and it's an interesting thing when you're the young lad on a building site that you're almost you find very quickly that the they you do, you've, you're def, you're protected by the older construction workers they they protect you they look after you it's almost like you become a surrogate son on the building site now they, they do play harmless kind of practical jokes on you but there's no malice in them and you're always met you're always the one who makes the tea and the reason why you make the tea is because subconsciously you're the purest one if they were to make the tea it would have the horrible f taste of all their frustrations angers the night before out drinking i tell you, you can learn an awful lot by working with irish men, irish men on a building site an awful lot an awful lot you can did those when you go around like the olden days like you went to england you saw the paddies on the building site i tell you if you were to go with or even new york if you were to go work with those people you you would get an education that you wouldn't get anywhere else because it's almost like being in lord of the rings or something like that and i got a hell of an education in working on building sites as a kid growing up but yeah i was always be made to make the tea and it was always the same thing your first day on the job they, they you, you, they'd look at you and they'll say okay go make the tea now and you would go make the tea and the the older building workers would drink the tea and that's a grand cup of tea and then you knew you had the job and then they were going to treat you nice from that point on you were the the, the, and that's why you had the tea lady in the old offices in the old days a lovely lady who went around with a gigantic canister of tea on a on a wheelie kind of trolley in the old days would bring the tea around and give them to the men and the women working in the, the office desks and that was the tea lady and there was she would be trusted as well because she would be putting her, mat, her maternal matriarchal energies into the gigantic canister and going oh hello mr mr goldstein here's your cup of tea oh hello mrs bradshaw here's your cup of tea oh that's lovely and here's a chocolate biscuit and it's the same kind of thing her energy was infused into that canister of water and that's why these people were removed and replaced with bloody starbucks and 
machines that make tea and all this kind of thing. We've forgotten our rituals. We've forgotten the beauty of these things. We've forgotten how important these things are. Now, one quick thing before I go. Yesterday was Shrove and Tuesday. And it's called Pancake Tuesday or Fat Tuesday in the rest of the world. And it's, it's associated as a Christian holiday, stuffing your face before Lent. Like all these other Christian holidays, it's most of them anyway, it's rooted in paganism. Yesterday was a pagan holiday where you ate pancakes and you're still supposed to be eating them. You're still supposed to be, it's not just that day. What you do is you get pancakes and you make them. You cover them in butter and honey and they represent the taking of the sun inside yourself to heat your, keep your body and your metabolism hot until you reach the Feast of Ostara, which was co-opted by the Christians and called um, Easter. The first pancake is, is, to, is, is an offering to your ancestors, and the second pancake, sorry, the first pancake represents the sun, the second pancake represents the, the, the opening of the doors to your ancestors, and the third one is an offering. You don't eat the last, sorry, they don't, not the third one, they don't eat the last pancake on the day. What you do is you throw it in the fire, and you give it as an offering to your deity. And this is all over Europe, all over Western and Northern Europe, which would be Odin if you're in the Nordic lands, Lu, the god of the sun, if you were in the Gaelic or Celtic lands, and veils if you were in the slavic world so remember that next year so i hope you've enjoyed tonight the, the new moon please continue this celebration of the wonder of the human psyche if you can over on people's internet radio if you want to stay here and listen to george you can but the 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 the, the, the three women over there are taking over this the baton from me and i'll see us next week www.thomasheridanarts.com and feck him if they can't take a joke.